Since the fall of man, a war has raged between good and evil. Over the centuries, this war has distorted the truth. Now the truth is perceived as lies, and lies acknowledged as truth. To this day, the battle continues as we investigate and debate the truth behind the history and mystery of the universe. We are Paratruth Radio. What's up, Para fans? My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. And you are listening to Paratruth Radio. Tonight, we are going to be talking about demons. We have special co-hosts on Heidi and Scott Linden from Talk Supernatural, and they're going to bring their input into the conversation with us. Now, the scriptures of the Holy Bible tells us that when Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him. These fallen angels were referred to as demons by Jesus in the Gospels. A demon, or fiend, is a supernatural, often malevolent being prevalent in religion, occultism, literature, fiction, mythology, and folklore. Now Paratruth presents Demons, the Shifting Shadows, with special guest co-hosts Heidi and Scott Linden from Talk Supernatural. Before we kick off this wonderful new episode, I just have to say one thing. I have to give a big shout out to my co-host, Justin, on his engagement to Shelly Saylor. Um, Congrats, man. It's awesome. I'm glad that uh, I'm speechless. (laughs) I don't even know what to say. <laughs> I, well, she is definitely my soulmate. Uh, she puts up with a lot with uh, us doing the show, so it's definitely a match made in heaven. Yeah, she's uh, she, she's kind of lucky because I was going to uh, get her phone number from you or just text message her on uh, Facebook here and basically either ram her phone or ram her Facebook until she decided to call into the show today uh, and surprise you by calling in. And no, it wasn't going to be an answer that I was going to accept. So uh, lucky for her, I actually forgot about it. (laughs) Well, lucky for her then. (laughs) But, you know, I guess it's a good thing I'm forgetful. (laughs) All right, folks, let's bring in Heidi and Scott Linden from Talk Supernatural into the show. Yay! <laughs> Get applause. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> How y'all doing? We're great. How are you guys doing? Good. Real good. We are fantastic. Mm-hmm. So uh, tonight we are talking about demons, and uh, you guys have done several shows with that theme in it. So why don't you uh, tell our listeners a little bit about you guys and uh, where your background comes from? Oh, we're going to go that deep, huh? Yeah. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, Well, for me, myself, um, I actually uh, have always seen spirits since I was a little girl and started practicing tarot cards and Ouija boards and stuff at probably, I would say, like seven years old. Um, I had some people teach me and then later on I find out that my family had practiced witchcraft so I started digging deeper into that area and I was always haunted by spirits which I thought were ghosts and then that went on through life and started uh, having issues as far as hauntings and medical issues and then I got another issue and I met my husband (laughs) (laughs) Until I met Heidi, and I just wanted to go out with a cute little redhead, and then I ended up uh, with this situation. <laughs> Our very first date, um, I told him about my, my haunted house, and he wanted to see what was up. And from there, we started to uh, realize that so many people have situations, spiritual situations, that they need help, but they don't know where to get it. So we sort of wanted to form our own team and try to help people get answers. So we became paranormal investigators, and we've been together doing that for about, what, 14 years. 
Yep, 14. Yep. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. All right, so we gave the definition of what a demon is. Uh, now, have you guys always thought that since you guys have been doing the investigations that hauntings are demons or did it start out as ghosts and then you guys got saved like we did and started, it started to make a little more sense? Yeah, I think it's exactly right. We started out thinking everything was pretty much a ghost and a lost soul or this or that. And as time went on, as we became, uh, became searching God's word, moving a little further into that, we realized there's a lot more to this. And we started seeing a lot of patterns and different things and understanding things and experience, I think, was most of it, just experiencing well, we just want to know why, like, every single ghost was so negative. Like, we were seeing mm-hmm. so many negative aspects. Why can't there be good ghosts? We're having a Casper. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, we started leaning more towards the line of demons when we were actually on an investigation. And oh, and that chick's head spun around. No, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Um, almost, though. <laughs> oh, she levitated. No, we're talking about me. Oh, oh. yeah. Get, oh, well, you love it. No. <laughs> we were on an investigation, and I was trying. we were trying to help this client who was physically being attacked continually by, by something dark. And we knew it was, it was dark because we could just feel something wasn't right in the house. We were all, like, nauseous, headaches, things like that. Mm-hmm. But something took over my body, and it was, it was such a horrible experience. I mean, I write about it in my book because it's, it's just so hard to explain in person. But it's something you feel. It's not just something you see. I was freaky, man. And I freaked everybody out because it took over my body. And from that point on, I realized we didn't know what the heck we were doing. And we really needed some answers. No, I should say we needed truth. We had plenty of answers on the New Age circuit. But we needed, we couldn't help this guy because here, here's me taken over by something. And it was definitely demonic because I had been wearing like this, this cross around my neck, um, like a necklace. And so I was so scared. I start, I guess I started laughing. It's really hard for me to explain because I, it was like I was there, but I wasn't there. It was like I was out of my body, but I started laughing at everybody, and I had this like urge to spit on my husband and like attack him and just. Yeah, and I didn't even do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Not this time, at least. <laughs> I was going to say, wasn't well, that was normal sitting... everyday life and married life? <laughs> well, we were still in the honeymoon phase. So oh, no. okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. But so then I, I tried to physically reach for this cross, and I was unable to do it. And and I was... Well, you know, the whole, the whole group was together. It was like five, five or six of us when this all happened together, and we all knew that something was not right here. This was like... And here we are in front of the client trying to help him, and we're like... Oh no! Now we're faced with yeah. our one of our leaders is I don't know temporarily possessed or <laughs> I was like what laughing at them. They said it was real eerie laughing. Yeah, and- it was like that's where she got his name Twisted Sister from. It was from this <laughs> episode that she had this twisted laugh and their little eyebrows went up in the air and it was yeah it was freaky (laughs) and uh, they just basically kept praying and praying and finally but the thing was what happened was it had left me and I was crying and laughing at the same time it was really weird and then all of a sudden the landlord of the premises that we were on because it was her tenant that had these issues and she was present too she he said do you do you need some tissues I said yeah so he went in the back bedroom to get me a box of tissues and then the landlord said oh my god that wasn't a good idea and we said why and she said, I saw a dark shadow go in there and he comes out and it had jumped to him and he started convulsing and he was, we were so scared because we thought this guy was going to die and we were going to be held responsible. We didn't know what to do. So at that point we were like, we need answers. And around that time we got into church and started finding them in the Bible. All right. Uh, Now, the one thing I know Justin and I have come across in regards to our own listeners, uh, and I know we've both had um, radio shows in the past where this is particularly, uh, I guess, <clears throat> common for us, was there's so many ghost hunters out there, so many mediums, so many spiritists who believe that one – there are good spirits, that they're not all demons. There are some humans that are walking around, or most of them are humans, and that they can always tell the difference between what is human and what is demonic. What are your thoughts on that? We have to go... We don't know everything, obviously. Mm-hmm. So what we do is we try to well, stay... I know everything. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me. Only because I'm the resource lady. Oh. <laughs> 
We try to go by everything that's in the Bible because that's our safeguard. If we okay. go out of it, we just things seem to happen that aren't good. So whether we're there's more to it than we think, but we just stay in our little area. And the Bible says that when someone dies and they knew Christ, they rest in peace until he comes back. But it doesn't say what happens to the people that weren't in Christ. Mm-hmm. So with all these experiences, and I'm not saying every single experience is, is a is a ghost, but I would think that there maybe there's some kind of, of thing where there are spirits of dead people. I don't know, but we always treat everything as the worst case scenario because whether it's a ghost or a demon, it's not supposed to be there. So mm-hmm. also realize you got your you mentioned mediums and different people like that. Right. And where are they getting their information from? Who are they hearing mm-hmm. from? Well they're hearing something. And remember the devil himself says he can come as an angel of light. So with that information you say, okay, so called medium, a lot of them aren't practicing anything biblical and it's like okay. And mm-hmm. Well they are, they're practicing the witch of Endor. Right. <laughs> who, who, who's talking to you? What do you hear? Are you hearing what they want you to hear? You know, or, or is it? Is it? Are you getting truth? So right. Well, uh, one thing that I've always said is there's always truth behind some lie. But if it's a demon talking to you, more than likely it's all lies. You just need to be able to discern what that what that is. Yeah, and they, they toy with everybody. I mean, a lot of people think that, you know, they can befriend a demon and, and, you know, that they have the authority to cast it out or they have, you know, the, I don't even know, the, the friendliness to, to hang out with them. <laughs> it's just, it's ridiculous what, what people, it's it's movies and stuff, and I think a lot of misinformation on the internet. Yeah. But with our experiences, that's never been the case. I mean, I was practicing, I was a psychic, a phone line psychic for years. And I thought I was doing right by God by helping these people. But, you know, the good comes with the bad when you're dealing with that. And when you're dealing with something good, you shouldn't have any bad. So I had to sort of like cut off, cut the umbilical cord there with the mediumship. And all of a sudden, everything started going good in my life. So that's that's where I would say, you know, the mediums. Well, you met me. Uh, <laughs> uh, how could things not be good if you met me? <laughs> that's when I was like, started wanting to become an alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> that can be a demon in itself. So <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> no, Scott's been awesome. I mean, what guy on his first date would totally accept some crazy chick? I mean, it was a blind date, more or less. No, you could see. No. I <laughs> <laughs> and you're lucky I did. <laughs> But, um, you know, and he, he was really into this. I and mean, he was there when a group came to investigate my haunted house. And, and they basically had said, you know, oh, yeah, you've got something here. And then that was it. And that's exactly what caused us to get started was there was, and even on TV, you see all these shows. And it's like they go to these places, they investigate things. And they're like, yeah, you got to go. Sure enough, we got evidence of it or whatever. It's like, okay, what are you going to do about it? Because there are a portion of people that want help. Right. So. Are you going to help them or just verify the information? I mean, going to the doctor's great to tell you, yeah, you got cancer. Have a nice day. I mean, well, how does that help me? Right. What can I do about it? All right, pair fans. We have Eric's random fact of the day, and we will be right back with Paratruth Radio. Now, Eric's random fact of the day. Do you ever find yourself becoming overly annoyed by commercial breaks during your favorite television shows and movies? Well, New Zealand is starting to take care of such annoyances. In fact, New Zealand now bans all advertisements on Christmas, Easter, Good Friday, and Anzac Day. This was Eric's Random Fact of the Day. The one thing that uh, that I enjoy about you guys' show is is just that you guys are bringing out truths and you're actually helping people. Most, like you said, most people that are paranormal investigators, well, not only do they not help, but they probably don't know how to help, or they don't have any type of Christian background, so they have no clue what they're what they're coming up against. 
Well, yeah, like we were actually just at someone's house this past week, and um, and she always saw herself as a Christian because she was raised Catholic, and so she had been praising, uh, praying on her rosary and everything, and she was being physically attacked by these demons, and I mean, she was borderline madness when we went over there, and we were just like, what are we getting into? And I saw for the first time ever something a, a very demonic force because you know some people say well how do you know if it's a demon or a ghost because when something black is tormenting somebody and you see it that's not good right. I mean, you know and it had formed behind her and and she was just she was getting, getting hurt and she was going nuts but she felt that um just praying was going to help her and i said that's there's more to it because you've got something here you've opened doors already and when you open doors you have to know how to close them or find somebody who does Mm -hmm. well i'm glad you brought up the opening doors thing because one thing that i did notice uh in the past week that both our show uh, a show on the fourth watch and your guys show brought up the charlie charlie phenomenon that's going on right now and that uh these people are basically using a another form of a ouija board and everybody thinks it's a game just like they always think ouija board is game and open up opening these doorways eric had come across something as well why don't you share that well, a uh, buddy of mine, uh, we go to school together and we're in a film class, uh, earning our film degrees together. And the one thing that he came across that was interesting is a trailer for a movie all about this whole Charlie Charlie phenomena. And the thought here, according to the article that he found and sent me, is that this whole Charlie Charlie thing is a way to kind of push forward this movie that's coming out or a, a, a raise awareness for it. Uh, and that's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And I mean, in a sense it's creative, but in another sense, I don't think the people who have created this film, if it really is indeed a film, I mean, could, the whole thing could be a huge hoax. Um, but I think the one thing they don't realize is how powerful this Charlie Charlie thing is and can become, especially as the word spreads, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because everybody's wondering, where did this come from out of the blue? And everybody, you know, they were kept tying it into some Mexican demon, and there's there's no evidence to that. I'm like, mm-hmm. where did this thing come from? And just like you said, I think nine times out of ten, people are innocently inviting demonic presence. You know, and part of the problem is, is a lot of people are under the assumption that, that the devil's in hell. And the Bible says that Satan was cast mm-hmm. into the earth with a third of the angels right. that rebelled. So they are here. And there's numerous scripture in the Bible that talks about how they torment people and that I mean, everything from a fever to palsy. I mean, madness. There's there's talks about a demon who made a guy cut in the caves. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so much. And people just don't have that knowledge. And I think that's where it renders them weak. Yeah, I, I completely agree. In fact, I mean, when just when you look up the word demon uh, or demon definition, for example, on the Internet, one of the very first definitions that comes up is an evil spirit or devil, especially one thought to possess a person or act as a tormentor in hell. And the one thing that the scriptures, as you just mentioned, don't tell us is that demons and the devil himself are currently residing in hell. It tells us that hell was created for them. Correct. For their torment, you know, for them to be tormented, uh, to be in agony forever and ever and ever. And it isn't until the book of Revelation that we find then the devil and the demons are all cast into hell and tormented forever and ever. And I don't know where this whole idea has come from. I don't know if it's just, uh, you know, people think, oh, well, you know, life is hell or hell on earth and so on and so forth. And so, you know, it's these demons that are raising a ruckus here and then bringing people to hell and raising more chaos, you know. But oh, yeah. uh, That's terrible. Yeah. Well, and- it's all about the, uh, the adversary just taking something from God. However he can do that, that will, mm-hmm. will satisfy him. You know, you only have to miss the mark by a little bit to miss it. You either miss it or you make it. 
and right. most of the people think, uh, well, you know, you got your way to to heaven, you got your way to salvation, and and that's great. And I got a path too. It's like, well, you're wrong because the path is narrow and it's small. There's only one way, but hell has broadened itself. It's going to make an allowance for a lot of people in this mm-hmm. demonic world we live in. This Charlie Charlie thing and all that. It's just another avenue to dig people a little deeper into. Uh, well, you know, if, if you get yourself into a position where you're possessed or you got so much demonic activity going around you, you might not ever find the truth. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, the scriptures tell us that uh, Satan is the prince of this world, uh, the prince of this time. And what do people usually do when, you know, you, you look at uh, Prince Harry, for example, you know, everyone looks up to him. That's what people do. They look up to a prince. They look up to a king. And the Bible tells us clearly that that's, that's basically what Satan is right now at this moment. And people don't see it clearly, you know. Yeah. And people like us, we we've experienced things. Mm-hmm. So we dug deeper. And I like with me, a lot of people have read my book and said, you know, oh, I'm so sorry for what you've been through. And I'm like, but the thing is, I'm not because then I wouldn't have had the. Tr- I feel like Neo, like in the Matrix. You know, it's like, <laughs> I took the pill and now I know. But I'm glad I know because now I can help other people. Right. Well, there's a lot of people, too, that, as you guys have been saying, that don't either want to accept the truth or are hiding away from the truth. And, you know, I've said the same thing, too, where I'm I was considering myself a medium Uh, more times than not, though, I whatever I was sensing felt like it was something completely not of this world something very dark and um you know i've said it numerous times to eric i'm not saying that i'm not feeling demons but from where i'm i'm understanding different things about the bible which i could be misunderstanding those two that there are are human spirits that end up here as well that doesn't mean that they're not all demons that just means that's what i believe right exactly well there's the i don't know factor like we said we don't know everything Mm -hmm. we just know where those in christ are those that are not in christ i don't know you also got this whole um um what do you call it residual residual it's like what is that and we've recorded some incredible things that are clearly residual and we're like how this don't even make sense and scott and i differ a little bit on that in our views because i'm just sort of like i'm still leaning more towards a demonic deception whereas he's like i don't know like you know we were uh we were at a mental this is when we were ghost hunting back back in the day Mm -hmm. and we caught some evps of a uh what's abandoned asylum yeah and it was i mean it was a um for the criminal Criminally insane. insane. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. And the EVPs tell them what they, what they were. They were the EVPs. We had we had, we had left our recorders inside of an empty, vacant building. No electricity. No gas. No water for many many years. Been shut down since the sixties. Just asbestos. Just asbestos. <laughs> and we left it. And we basically left the building and went to another building and come back. Um, I don't know, hour or two later. And then we took the recordings home and we listened to them. And somewhere in this house we have them. But these recordings are as clear. As you and I talking right now, we could hear as if though we had an active day Mm -hmm. at the asylum when it was operating. You could hear the dinner bells. You could hear the pages. You'd hear doctors' names. Everything extremely clear as though it was going on that minute. And this building didn't even have a light bulb in it. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually went back and then looked up these names. And sure enough, there was doctors at that time that worked there. So this was clearly residual. And it's like, how does this make sense? I, I, I could never make sense out of it. Why? I understood it. It was real. We, you know, we got it on recording, but I don't know how. What? Right, why? Right. So we just right. don't know what that was. Yeah, and I, and I can see, you know, both of your sides here. You know, obviously residual. Jeez, I mean, I, I can't begin to even understand that in regards to the whole uh, dimension thing, you know, how there's multiple dimensions or whatever, uh, and the possibility that something is, could be echoing throughout time, you know, could kind of like, yeah, I've exactly. heard stories about people hearing a gunshot that happened back in the 18, 1700s, and it's like, well, how can that gunshot happen to still be there at the same time every year on the exact same day, exact same time, so on and so forth. But on the other hand, when you think of the possibility that 
demons are portraying these things, the possibility that they're just deceiving us. I mean, they have been around for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Satan was capable of turning himself into a serpent. I mean, that's at least that's what I believe, and I know there's people who believe that the serpent was completely different from Satan. Um, but I personally believe that Satan was the serpent, and that he's able to turn himself into that. I also hear about black dogs and you know all these other types of beasts yep. that I think demons are very well capable of taking shape and form. So why not create these these echoes, these dinner bells, these random people talking? I mean. I think demons are very well capable of manipulating voices easily, uh, manipulating smells even, you know, the smell of a cigar, the smell of a perfume that your grandma used to wear. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, well, maybe it sucked us in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I think it's possible. I think both are possible, but this is another one of those factors where we just don't know. And honestly, right. I think I yeah, accept it. We, we don't know everything. Yeah. And I think I actually accept both of your views because you both say you really don't know. And that's something I can relate to where there's so many people out there who are like, well, I do know, and this is a fact. And I'm like, all right, you're telling me this, and yet you don't have any significant evidence to show me. You know, there's nothing in the Bible that proves this. There's yeah, no other books that'll, yeah, you know, what do you got? So that, yeah, that's a tough one, but interesting, very interesting. Yeah. I'm probably right, though, because I'm usually more right. <laughs> <laughs> it's that I make him think he's right, so we'll talk about that in another show. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Part of that deceit, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> more and more me leaning towards Heidi being a demon. <laughs> <laughs> what? Whoa. Fighting I'm not going to go there. <laughs> 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 well, you know, one thing that a lot of people will come back to with, with demons is, you know, as far as hauntings is concerned, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, well, it's not attacking anybody. It's not it's not doing any harm. We're just hearing things. P- things are being moved. And uh, a lot of people don't understand that if it is demons, you know, that's what they're trying to do is have that deceit and in turn have that power over you well I think there's a, a set of unwritten rules that that says there has to be a certain amount of acceptance before the demon's allowed to do X amount mm-hmm. I, and like I said it's kind of an unwritten rule it's like okay well if I come as an angel of light or give you enough information that's a positive information or true information because the adversary will always mix lies with truth he'll mix them because that's what right. confuses you. And then little by little, if you start feeding into it, well, now it's the open door. You've allowed more and more and more. You hear a lot of people start with a Ouija board. And they get one little response. If somebody really gets into it over time, these things will begin to tell them all sorts of information. But then eventually, that information turns into commands and ideas and thoughts, and it takes more power and control over you. So it's the idea of letting it in, opening the door, giving it permission. And so at first, it may start out like just a little tap here, scratch here, a little voice. It's a friendly ghost idea, and then become something more down the road. And that's common. We've seen it in so many of our cases. Little kids thinking it's this person or someone saying, well, my grandma. And a lot of times we'll find someone says, oh, my grandma died. And all of a sudden I start seeing her. And and a lot of times I find that there's generational curses where it's the, the grandma had the demonic stuff going on. So when she died, just sort of like with the, um, the crazy man and Jesus had to send them somewhere. So he sent them to the pigs. So when someone who does have a demon around them or with them and some that person dies, where's it going to go? So by biblical law, the generational curse, it would go down to the next person. And we find that a lot, too. Mm-hmm. That's actually the first time I've heard something like that outside of fiction as far as it actually happening to somebody. From me saying it? Well, yeah, from you guys telling us oh. about about your investigations, I, like I, I I think that it, it can can happen, but more times than not, like you'll hear about these things in, for example, uh, Anne Rice did a a book about uh, a trilogy about witches, and it's basically about a witch who has a demon that is handed down from her by her great aunt after she passes away to do. 
her bidding or his bidding, whatever you want to call it, but I, I've never heard it in the real world. Well, I do watch a lot of sci-fi, too, so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> she could be mixing things up here. Right, maybe. I don't <laughs> I know, know I... what's truth anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what's going on? See, Heidi Demon. See, it makes <laughs> oh, total boy. sense. Oh, great. It's going to be all over the hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I think I'm, I'm really into the whole generational curse just because I was a victim of it myself. And mm-hmm. the one the one incident with me was all through my life, and I was seeing spirits, and I was always sort of paralleled whispering by my family that I was going to be like my crazy relative. And so I, I kept everything I saw to myself because I didn't want to be on medication like her. And so, you know, they, they would always talk about her. And then I found out later on during a family event that I was seeing a spirit where I'd never seen it at my mom's house. And when she showed up, she, and, and it sort of like faded away, but when she showed up, she started screaming and she's like, don't you see him? He's right there. It's the cowboy. She was describing the exact same thing I did. And I mean, what are the chances of that ever? And, and it just hit me that, you know, she was on the side that they practiced the witchcraft and that whole, all the women and my aunts and grandma and everything. So, you know, and then we find out from other people that, well, in our investigations, we'll ask them questions and we'll find out, you know, what are you practicing? What are your family practicing? And it all seems to be trickle down to the same thing, occult use or mediumship. Mm-hmm. Well, what kind of got us started uh, with the whole paranormal world was the both of us as kids had Ouija boards. Uh, and as we grew up, we, we started talking a lot about it. And, you know, the one day we decided maybe there's something to this maybe we need to dig deeper so that's what started our first show started our ghost hunting uh career if you can call it that and uh a lot of times you know we we didn't know what we were going up against Uh, we didn't know how to protect ourselves and uh it wasn't until we had come back to Christ that we started understanding a little bit more how to do those things. Yeah, and then you start seeing things a lot more clearly. Yeah. Right. Well, and like the one thing that's interesting to me in regards to this whole discussion that we're having right now, um, Justin, our, Justin and I are family. We're cousins. And so my mom and his dad brother and sister grew up together in the house that I used to live in and for the longest time my sisters and I Ouija board or not we would always see things hear things lights would flicker and unex- you know just it'd be unexplainable um door knobs would rattle there'd be footsteps coming up the stairs when nobody's home but us kids and like my mom would always deny it and I remember one night it was actually New Year's Eve, uh, maybe year 2000 or so, something like that, 99. And we were all upstairs, me, some of my cousins, my sisters, and I forget what we were doing, but the light started flickering in my bedroom. And we freaked out. And we went downstairs and we were talking about to our parents about how, like, we think the house is haunted and this and that. And suddenly, my mom, my uncle started busting up laughing and started having a discussion about how, when they were growing up in the same exact house, they used to witness the same exact things, and they always believed it to be haunted. And it's just kind of weird that from one generation to the next, whatever this was, the spirit transferred, you know, started bothering us. And now my cousin, Kurt, one of my cousins, uh, Justin's brother, actually currently lives in the same house. And he's not experiencing anything at all. So then they have to wonder, like, where did this spirit go? You know, was it just attached to, you know, my family, my immediate family? Or uh, did it decide to go off somewhere else for some reason? Or, you know, what happened? Did but, you, uh, uh, did you look yeah. in a closet? <laughs> Uh, uh, all the closets actually are open for the most part. <laughs> none, none of them ever really had doors. <laughs> I did, just, I, just a thought, no problem. Yeah, I, mean, I didn't check under the beds really, so that's a possibility. Uh, you see so, Monsters Inc., right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Now you know where we get our info from. <laughs> you guys are calling me the demon. Wonderful. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, you're the demon. He's just weird. <laughs> okay, nice. Well, all these years I've been trying to figure it out, but thank you for that revelation. Yeah. Better watch it, boys. I'm old enough to be your father. <laughs> and that says a lot. <laughs> well, and Eric, you have to realize, too, like when you guys moved into the new house, you were having those different things happening to you oh, yeah. as well. Absolutely. We moved oh, so we know where it went then. It came with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's a very big possibility. You know, it came with us. When we moved here, there was a uh, an orb, a green, a greenish blue orb that would always catch our eye. That's and a Christmas bulb. No. <laughs> <laughs> Easy explanation, Eric. See? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, how, that's how they get us. They make us think that. And we forget all about it. Yeah. But, um... Yeah, we would all see it. The whole family would see this thing. And one thing that was interesting is, oh, for several months, I would, you know that that point where you're almost asleep? You know, you're not fully asleep, but you're not fully awake either. You're kind of in between. Um, And I would always hear my name whispered. And it would snap me up, you know, and I'd be wide awake and like, what the heck was that? And that went on for a couple of months. And finally, I brought it to my mom and my sister's attention one day in the kitchen. I was like, you know, there's something weird going on every night. I'm like in between the stage of almost asleep, but not yet completely asleep. I would hear a whisper and my sister turns around. She's like, wait, does it sound like this? Aaron?" And I'm like, yeah, it's exactly the same. She's like, I hear it every night too. And like, well, that's pretty interesting. And so I ended up, you know, diving into this kind of thing and I did an investigation here and some nightmares started happening and I dug deeper and deeper and deeper and eventually it turned into a full out uh, demonic affliction on me for about three months straight which is what eventually led me to Christ and led us to our radio shows as well what do you think helped you the most Christ or the radio show (laughs) oh Christ for sure oh okay The radio show was just the uh, the the venting part of it. Yeah, that's how I feel too. That's that is for us too. We get so many emails with people asking all these questions, and I it's like every response is almost like a book back because they ask so many. And I think people have so many questions about this, and you can decipher who really wants help and answers, and who just sort of wants to play around. Right. You know, we've actually been pretty fortunate with our podcast so far is that a lot of the people are actually seeking help because uh, we cover a lot of different categories and, and except think, for people who just want to drink and they want to like listen yeah, to Scott be crazy <laughs> but that would be me we know that I always give the best information <laughs> we've been over that but you know um, I think the biggest problem we have I think with everything is the fact that religion has made people so leery of of the Bible that they're they don't even want to look at they can't trust it because they've heard so many viewpoints and so many variations that they don't even know where to go and that's why their belief in demons is null and void almost demons and ghosts mm-hmm. it's easier to believe in a ghost and, and listen to some show on TV than it is to believe in something biblical because they've heard all these different aspects and beliefs or seen so much hypocrisy in their life that they're like why would I want to be a part of that and so I don't yeah. always blame and I'm very careful for those who don't believe what I believe or know what I know because I also understand what's happened to them to put them in the position of spiritually where they're at right and i think a lot of people you know they they want to believe in some kind of good news you know that like these spirits are indeed family members or something uh, of the past because you know no one really wants that bad news like oh there's a demon on my trail great you know <laughs> um i mean i don't like that kind of news but it happens but yeah i, I can definitely see and i never really looked at it quite like that so, so yeah, kind of, kind of an eye opener. Definitely interesting. Yeah, I open eyes often. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. My job. I, I don't know what I'd do without you, man. <laughs> I don't. Well, when I was uh, in my twenties, and I was 
I mean, I, I was doing tarot cards for a living and stuff like that. And I, like I said, I thought I was helping people love the money that I was making. But I actually had a neighbor who was a Christian, and she was the nicest lady. And she just kept trying to, you know, to help me and, and to try and tell me what I was doing was wrong and stuff. And I just wasn't ready to listen. It wasn't my time. And then it would be like another year later, almost the same scenario. I was dating somebody whose mom was Christian, and she did not know what I practiced because he knew she was Christian. And he said, you know, don't tell her because he was okay with it. But he's like, just don't tell her. And she had come over to my house to visit and she knew instantly she was like what are you doing in this house and I didn't know what she was talking about and she said are you you know are you practicing witchcraft and I said no because I had attributed witchcraft to like you know cauldrons and cats and brooms and stuff (laughs) and and I said no and she started naming stuff and she knew instantly and she told me there was a demon in my house she didn't know about all my issues but somehow she knew and that just started little things like that little steps and that's how I you know if, if those people wouldn't have put those little ideas into my head early on I don't know where I'd be right now yeah it's amazing what the Holy Spirit does through someone no kidding I've heard it several times people talking to me and you know it, it's just something out of the ordinary that you wouldn't hear them say and it's like well God had to have been talking through you to me because I needed to hear that All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break here and listen to Justin's Paranormal Headlines. And now, Paratruth Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Hey, Parafans. Justin here with your Paranormal Headlines. Were dinosaurs warm or cold-blooded? A new study suggested that prehistoric reptiles were most likely to be warm-blooded like mammals. The question over whether the dinosaurs were cold-blooded like today's reptiles and fish or warm-blooded like mammals and birds has remained a topic of controversy and debate for years. While many experts have settled on the idea that dinosaurs were actually somewhere in the middle with both cold-blooded and warm-blooded traits, a new study has this week thrown another spanner in the works by suggesting that they were, in fact, almost certainly warm-blooded. Upon reanalysis, it was apparent that dinosaurs weren't just somewhat like living mammals in their physiology, said study author and paleontologist Michael Demick of Stony Brook University. They fit right within our understanding of what it means to be a warm-blooded mammal. Demick's reanalysis focused on two main aspects of the original study, with the first being the scaling of yearly growth rates to daily ones in an attempt to standardize comparisons a discrepancy that he contends failed to take into account variable growth rates throughout the year. In addition, Demick also argues that birds, which are now commonly believed to be the modern-day descendants of dinosaurs, are warm-blooded and that therefore dinosaurs probably were too. Separating what we commonly think of as dinosaurs from birds in a statistical analysis is generally inappropriate because birds are dinosaurs, They're just the dinosaurs that haven't gone extinct, he said. While his findings are unlikely to be sufficient on their own to prove that dinosaurs really were warm-blooded, his efforts will no doubt fuel further study into this 65-million-year-old mystery. NASA prepares for second flying saucer test. The space agency will be testing out its futuristic Mars landing system over Hawaii this week. While NASA's sky crane mechanism was successful in lowering the Curiosity rover onto the surface of Mars back in 2012, landing the modules necessary for human habitation on the Red Planet is going to require something a lot bigger and a lot stronger. The low-density supersonic decelerator was designed specifically with this in mind. Consisting of a rocket-powered platform and a large inflatable saucer-shaped device known as the Supersonic Inflatable Aerodynamic Accelerator, the system is designed to lower payloads of up to three tons safely onto the surface of Mars with the help of a super-strong parachute. Last year, the LDSD was lifted to a height of 180,000 feet, where the air is as thin as it is on Mars, for a test flight that ultimately succeeded even though the parachute was torn to shreds on the way down. This month, however, the team is back in Hawaii to try again, and this time they've built a much stronger parachute that they believe will be able to withstand the forces of the descent. 
The new test is scheduled to take place sometime over the next two weeks, depending on the weather conditions tomorrow being the earliest possibility. If it succeeds, then the ultimate goal of a manned mission to Mars will be one step closer. And this has been Justin with your Paranormal Headlines. This was a segment of Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Well, uh, Scott, we've heard what got Heidi into the whole paranormal. Uh, what originally got you started? Was it meeting Heidi? Was there stuff before that that got you started into it? Well, there was one incident before I met Heidi that I guess gave me enough enough uh, of, of experience at a young age to realize that there was a level of truth in so when I met Heidi I believe and that was a Ouija board incident mm-hmm. that I had did uh, with a friend of mine and um, she really gotten into it and set everything up and, and took it real seriously and we definitely seen some very serious results in within 45 minutes I mean this this thing was moving so quick across the board that it was leaving our hands and so if it's almost moving on its own, we begin to say, okay, it's not us anymore. It's not a trick. Right. And I never did anything like that again, but it was enough of an experience for me that when I met Heidi and she began to tell me some of these crazy stories, I had enough belief because of my one experience that I was willing to listen. And uh, like she had said, the, the first date we had, we experienced now he told me all this junk but went back to apartment and actually experienced some of it i was like oh oh, man (laughs) just kept going from there (laughs) so what got you guys started in actually doing the radio show i know you guys have swat supernatural this world needed to hear from me this world (laughs) Experience <laughs> of me and, and, and what so they know when to turn the radio off <laughs> That's fine. but no it, it's funny because you just brought it up i believe i heard from god and it was in a dream and i thought he talked to me you no know, i talked oh so i guess yeah sort of like the same thing <laughs> but because <laughs> he lives inside of me so it's the same thing yeah so he lives inside of me both of us we're all like one flesh what anyways so <laughs> yeah um no i just I mean, I just had this dream, and I prayed on it the next day about it, and Scott came home from work, and, <laughs> and I was like... Oh, yeah, this is the way it always goes for me, and it's just like, <laughs> hey, we're going to so so and we're going to help the police investigate this or that, or, oh, today we're doing a podcast, and this is going, I'm like, oh, okay, well, all right, um, whatever I was doing don't count, but yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> well... One thing that uh, got us started is mostly we were, you know, we were talking about it to to ourselves, and we're like, you know, we should we should talk about this on air because we had our own theories about things, but you know, it, it's one of those things that if you don't get it out there, pe- people won't get educated and they won't know. Right, you know, and it's it's we've actually had a, some feedback from a few. Uh, people who have actually put a few thoughts in our mind that we actually said, hmm, never thought about that. Yeah, like that. this one yeah. lady, she said, you should consider leaving Scott. And I was no, like, no, no, they never. <laughs> <laughs> like a rug. <laughs> no, but for real, yeah. Well, we've, it's it's neat to, to hear because that, that's our, always our main goal in everything that we do. I and mean, we've held lectures, you know, and that was the main reason why I wrote my book because I want to... Travel the world back no, and forth to the moon, up no, and down, in and out of the earth. <laughs> yeah, the heaven, babes. No. We want, we want to get the truth out to people, too. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I want to discuss here real quick and kind of get your both of your view on this, in regards to magicians and paganism, one of the leaders that people many have 
many people have followed over the years uh, was the works of Elister Crowley. Uh, a lot of his biography and stuff that people have followed. And I, I've dis- had this discussion with some pagans who claim that Elister Crowley was a good guy. He never really practiced black magic and this and that. He was an evil guy. Um, um, you know yeah. what? He was good. He was really good for nothing. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I agree. And, you know, and I, every time I had these conversations with these people, I'd lay down all the facts and the books and the references and, you know. But the one thing that's interesting, and this kind of goes back to uh, to a book known as The Lesser Key of Solomon and some historical belief uh, that Solomon was capable at one point after he kind of fell away from God for a while, that he was able to come up with magic that was capable of controlling demons to do his own bidding. And I guess my question for you guys, just to see what you think, is there a way, a, a, a possibility to create some kind of magic which is indeed capable of summoning a demon and controlling it and preventing it from harming you, per se, uh, while all the same kind of getting it to do what you want it to do? Well, I think there's two ways of looking at this. Now, if you're, if you're doing work for the enemy and you're doing that enemy a good service... I suppose, to some extent, he's going to protect you to allow you to do his deed, mm-hmm. but only for a time, until that deed is done or until he's gotten what he's wanted. And that's often how the adversary always works. Do I believe you can summon a demon? Yeah, that's, that's, that's been proven with the Ouija board and lots of different things. I mean, getting mm-hmm. one. But thinking you're going to control it? No. No. No, I, don't believe that at I all. think people forget, and I don't know where I, I would say this got lost between Hollywood and TV, but I think people really forget the true nature of a demon, and they've they've sort of molded their own concept of what he is or what they are. But mm-hmm. when you've got a demon, I mean, their main goal is to destroy and lie and kill. So what means that you could trust anything? Right. You know, I, I was, like, when I was doing all my occult stuff, I mean, I was doing a lot of stuff. I was doing spells. I mean, there, when I was eight years old, I was talking to a little spirit that I thought her name was Sarah. She was this little girl in my house. I now know it had to have been demonic because of some other things that transpired. But Sarah would tell me, like, one time she said, you know, she, like, gave me the unction of, like, some kind of rambling to say to make my neighbor sick. And... I remember waking up at night, like mumbling this in my in my sleep, and I was doing it throughout the day. And then that night, I we were all uh, we were eating dinner, and then we started cleaning up. My dad was late. He comes home, and he tells my mom, "You know, do you, did you hear what happened to Mara?" And that was our next door neighbor. She said mm-hmm. no, and and next thing you know, she was in the hospital with like some kind of food poisoning, or she was sick or something. <laughs> So some people say, oh, you know, you cast a spell. Not really. I was just used to do evil. But Mm -hmm. it's how you look at it. Well, the the question is, like, why would the spirit have you say anything? Why not the spirit just go and do it? Oh, that's not the way it works. (laughs) Just like God always uses his people to do his work. In all, all, anything biblical you find, God always uses somebody to do the work. Adversary has to use, it's a different realm. They're going to use something, something, some way is going to open a door to allow them to use. And it's going to be you or, or somebody else. It's going to be somebody that can allow them to be the hands and the feet and the voice. They need permission. It's, it's sort of like a chain of command. It's, you know, just like our world is run through the governments and things like that. And I, I believe, I strongly believe just from what we read biblically and what we personally experience that there has to be a chain of command with the demonic just as anything else. That, that idea of chain of command in general came from someplace and I think it began right from the beginning of time when 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 God you know created the world and the people and all that or when Satan came. came to in front of uh, God in the book of Job and he had to ask permission and God said okay you can do this but don't do this you can mm-hmm. do this and he wasn't allowed to do anything more you know so I think it's the same thing with his little minions all right all right well one one final thing that comes to mind for me. No, I I, I won't do autographs. <laughs> Where Darn I'm, it! I'm, I was just thinking that. Stop reading my mind. You're a demon too. Um, <laughs> You're a demon. <laughs> uh, you know, there's there's a lot of Hollywood out there that uh, depicts these different 
true stories or based on a true story of demonic possession or hauntings or whatever do you guys think that they ever hit it on on the nose or hit the mark anywhere close as far as effects or as far as story or either i believe often uh maybe not to all the detail and you know they might mix some up but i think there's a lot of times in fact we talked about that several podcasts ago about um like um the enemy not enemy of a horror but uh, exorcist mm-hmm. and in the movie they actually belittled the actual facts mm-hmm. of what really happened because i think at the time in the 70s they're probably thinking you know what this sounds a little too unbelievable to tell the truth Mm -hmm. so they actually belittled the story yeah they totally downplayed it they downplayed the whole thing uh, to what really happened so uh they have it yeah sometimes sure they embellish the whole thing but no they have hit the mark several times and there's things that i've seen and just known that, yep. And actually, they're getting closer. And I think it's because people like um, some of these writers and, and people, because they probably experiencing stuff of their own, are hitting the mark even closer. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times you'll find out a lot of these producers and writers and even authors are telling of their dreams. Well, I dreamt this. And, um, you know, and the, I was just telling Scott what I had saw at, I had seen at that house the other night when that black thing manifested right behind our clients. I said, you know what it reminded me of? It exactly like in the movie, the old movie, I think 78 to the entity. And it was just like that. And so I think these movies do, do hit yeah, well, These ideas come from someplace. Yeah. I mean, sometimes it's totally made up and we can go to Stephen King stuff and look at some of the creatures he's come up with. Yeah. And we obviously know that it's like, okay, well that was fun. But then there's other things you look at and you go, whoa. That's just freaky. And as far as activity, I believe a lot of that activity that we see in movies does happen. I think a lot of times people don't want to talk about it, or they just personally don't experience it. They're sleeping or whatever. And you also got to remember during a movie, too, that they're taking a whole bunch of situations or time, and they're compacting it into an hour, hour and a half, two-hour program. Yeah. So you can take stuff that's happened over a period of five years, and you're cramming it into a two-hour time slot in a movie. So it looks like a lot, but over a two- or three-year period, that wouldn't seem like so much happening every six months or nine months in your own life. Right. Well, a lot of times, too, on these different films and sets, you know, there's actually some type of demonic or haunting type of uh, experiences going on with the different crew members. I... I, I, God, I can't remember what movie it was. Oh, the Poltergeist. I just yep. read an article about the Poltergeist where there was a bunch of majorly bad activity going on when they were shooting the original movie, Poltergeist. Absolutely true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Beatles, it, just not to mention, is probably the truest <laughs> of them all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. And that's by far the, the scariest movie. See his name. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were, just, we were actually just shooting for a, um, a TV show for this fall. We were doing an episode... Hey, Naked and afraid. No. <laughs> no. 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 But, um, so while we were shooting it, they, they picked a, a Masonic temple to shoot at, which was very known, well known to be haunted. And so while we're shooting, we experienced all kinds of weird activity. And I got some crazy pictures. I'm like, because I was just taking pictures of us being filmed. And we stuff. got a picture of an extra being in one of our pictures that wasn't there yeah so you know and the thing is so we were experiencing stuff and we were just shooting for a tv show so i think when you're sensitive to that stuff and you're open to it and i know like when in the poltergeist movie they were using real human remains Mm -hmm. so it's like oh my goodness you know how freaky is that right absolutely and you know i think when it comes to uh the most recent films coming out i actually i go back to uh the paranormal activity films that uh, have come out and not so much the most recent ones like the marked ones I didn't even bother seeing that but the very first Paranormal Activity when I first saw that it reminded me so much of my own personal experience and how dead on it really is uh, to how Paranormal Activity literally progresses over a matter of time it begins subtle with the knocks and you know this and that and then flourishes from there with the footsteps and the doors moving and slamming and things breaking and so on and so forth 
And the one thing, and I, I know not a lot of people have seen this, but there are two two endings to that film. There's two different versions out. Uh, there's a Hollywood version in which at the end of the film, you know, the, the lady, I can't remember her name, but the lady who is possessed comes rushing the camera and her face turns into like this demonic looking face. Um, and that's the most common one. Hollywood purposely. <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood purposely had that happen because they thought it would draw in more people. But the original ending was after she killed her husband, she walked up into her bedroom, sat on the floor, and just rocked back and forth for three days straight. And one time she stopped when her sister walked in the door and found her husband's body. And when the sister ran away, she started rocking again. And eventually cops came to find out what was going on, found the lady rocking, and she charged them, and he, they killed her. And I thought that it was by far just amazing how these writers and these directors put this together and just thinking of, like, the mindset that some people have when they're possessed or, you know, just the, when they have mental disabilities, you know? As you had mentioned earlier, early in the show, uh, demons are capable of causing disease you know and putting people in these situations in which like schizophrenia for example and stuff like that you know that's that could all be demonic and it is quite amazing that oh, these days you know people are just getting becoming so accurate with how things truly are and i don't know if that's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing because you know in one sense i think oh great this is awesome because now people will see what it really is and maybe stop doing what they're doing. But on the other hand, it might just numb their senses. They might think, oh, this is just Hollywood. And then they'll continue doing what they do only to find out the hard way, you know? Oh, I totally think people are being desensitized. I mean, we personally don't watch scary movies because we, we've seen so many real things that that stuff like you, it just brings back memories or we just know it's real. So we don't, we don't, that's not entertainment to us anymore, mm -hmm. but so we don't allow our kids to, but uh, my oldest son, he's 23 and he was flipping through the channels and there was some scary movie on that, that he was watching for a few minutes and he came out and told me, he goes, I remember you allowed me to watch this when I was like eight years old. <laughs> I can't believe I did. And he said, he goes, well, it's not even scary, but I was really scared at eight. And the thing is, so now a movie from back then isn't even scary anymore. So they have to keep upping their game with, with yeah. demons. We see more of demons than anything now. Well, yeah. I know that you young men aren't old enough to <laughs> appreciate it. But I remember when Jaws came out, I, I was a kid, but I remember my parents coming back and I was at the babysitters and they were like scared to death. That movie was, and that was Jaws. That wasn't even right. a, a horror film. But now they come to like 5 o'clock on Sunday yeah, for the kids. <laughs> it's like, that's a family program. Yeah, but it, things have it, changed. And so now, yeah, Heidi was hitting it on the mark there. You always have to up the game, up the game. It's never enough. And uh, because of what we do and we have to experience some real things, I mean, the, the idea is garbage in, garbage out. So we have to make sure that what we put into our heads and our minds is is not garbage. We have our experience to live off of, and the things that we have to deal with to help other people. But we don't go out of our way to, you know, pick and choose stuff off of TV and programs just to freak us out. So the extent of our scary movies would be Svengooly. <laughs> <laughs> well. I did want to give you guys a chance to uh, tell everybody where they can find you guys and uh, listen to the show and all that good stuff because we are getting close to the end. Oh, okay. Well, um, our show's uh, broadcasted on Spreaker. You just go to Talk Supernatural Radio and you'll find us. Or you can always go on Twitter at TSR Parapod. And um, my book website is HeidiKLinden.com. You can check that out, too. And our SWAT website for anybody that needs more information on demonic, you always do that, is eph612swat.com. All right. I wanted to thank you guys for coming on. It has been a blast. Thank you for putting up with us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, hopefully we will have you guys on again. It, it's definitely fun to get other people's perspectives and not only that but also to have cooperation through what we do and, and that, 
imagine having a legend like me on. So. Oh. Absolutely, Always. of course. <laughs> I mean, I know our show's going to fly off the charts now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much. All right, have a good night, guys. Take you care. Too. All right, folks, that was Heidi and Scott Linden from Talk Supernatural and SWAT Supernatural investigative team. And uh, we've done a pretty good job of giving you guys what demons are. Um, I did want to have you, Eric, give the people some scriptures that kind of mention demons. So as we were discussing throughout the show, one of the very first things that was mentioned and also one of the last was the possibility or even the fact that demons do create disease, disorders, all kinds of things. And scripture is and scripture is very prominent on these things. In Matthew 12:22, the scripture says, "Then was brought to him, Jesus, one possessed with the devil." blind and dumb and he healed him so that the blind and dumb both spoke and saw and so what this is telling us here is that demons are capable of blinding people from birth and they're capable of creating mental disorders that would prevent people from being like the rest of us if you will you know so that in itself i think is very interesting and i don't necessarily believe that all diseases that all disorders are caused by demons you know when we fell from grace when adam and eve took the apple that in itself brought death upon us and it also brought on a number of other ailments and uh it just so happens that illness is one of them so i i think definitely when something like this happens when it comes to disorders of any sort or illness should definitely be praying about it and look to god at all times because whether it's demonic or not only god is the one who can truly truly heal you the second verse that i'd like to share is one in which empowers us as christians and the fact that the holy spirit gives us power to not only do god's will and complete god's will but to stand against the enemy to cast out demons from places that they shouldn't be. In the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 1, it says, When he, Jesus, had called to him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits, to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. So here we're seeing that the Holy Spirit has given them the ability to cast out demons with a single word. Although in Scripture, Jesus does tell us that there are some demons that can only be cast out through prayer. So don't be just running out there and saying, you know, in the name of Christ, I command you to leave because it's not always going to work. You got to really know, you know, have your heart with Christ and know where you stand with God before you go out and do something like this. Because as we said, was I think two episodes ago, uh, these kind of things backfire. When you try to cast out a demon, be careful. Because if your heart isn't right with God, the demon might have the upper hand. No, well, it's but, just like going into battle. You have to have an arsenal in order mm-hmm. to pull from, in order Ex- to absolutely. defeat the enemy. And, and I'm glad you bring that up, because the arsenal that Christians have through the Holy Spirit is actually referenced in the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. I'm not going to read that right now because it's actually a very long one. But it's basically, <laughs> <laughs> but it is about the armor of God and how God protects you uh, protects you through his word, through the gospel, uh, and through truth and righteousness, through faith. And that's something that every Christian has to have when they go into battle. And I know it it seems difficult sometimes to uh, fight a battle every day. But as Christians, we are fighting a battle every single day. And so you always have to be geared up in everything. All your armor, have your weapons ready. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. And that is the only thing that can strike down the enemy. But going off of Matthew 2, 10 1 in which christ gave his 12 disciples power against unclean spirits uh and the ability to cast them out and to heal all manners of sickness and all manners of disease kind of leads us into another verse which is very interesting uh and it's in the book of luke 
chapter 11, verses 24 through 26. And I know I've uh, read this particular verse numerous times over on air. But I'm going to read it again. It says that when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finds nothing. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they go in and live there. And the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. This particular passage I think is one of the most important to remember when it comes to uh, our faith and the enemy, because if we were to cast a demon out or if we were to cast a demon out of our own home, whether it's out of a person or out of our own home, if it is not replaced by the Holy Spirit, that unclean spirit, that demon will come back and it will come back with vengeance. It's something that we all, whether you're Christian or not Christian, it's something that we all have to take serious and keep in mind because you don't want to be in a battle against someone who has a gun and realize all you have is a pencil. That'd be you hard know, to beat. <laughs> that's, a, that's hard to beat. And that's basically what this is. When you go into a battle against a demon, against the spiritual forces of evil that the Bible constantly tells us that we are always, always, always a part of, always in battle with. If we were to go into that battle with a simple little pencil versus thousands of only God knows what kind of weapons that demons have, you know, Mm -hmm. we're going to fail. But when we go in with the Holy Spirit, we go in with a sword. And yes, you think, well, it's a little tiny sword against thousands and thousands of devils. But this sword is a sword unlike any other sword. It's a sword of God, a sword of the Holy Spirit. It's a sword that is capable of defeating thousands and thousands and thousands of demons with one single swipe. So, uh, it's definitely something to remember, something that's very important. And I think just in regards to this whole discussion on demons, uh, and I think Justin would agree with me on this, it's not something you want to tackle alone. Absolutely not. If you were to come across a demon, whether it's in your home or a friend who claims or believes or some kind of activity, whether this activity is you know, all nice and kind and happy and joyful. And it's Casper, the friendly ghost. And, you know, all it wants to do is party and have fun and watch TV and this and that. You always got to remember that even the most beautiful creatures on earth, the colorful, the bright, the ones that look like, you know, they just want to be touched and held. Those are the ones that are the most deadliest. And I think that that is just something that we have to, have to, have to keep in mind. And I'm going to go right out on a limb here and just say this. Um, I'm going to put this, this is an offer. I'm going to put this out there for anyone listening who either has been through some kind of paranormal activity, who's currently going through paranormal activity or has a friend going through paranormal activity of some sort. And you're questioning what it is you're going through. You're questioning whether or not this entity could be harmful to your health and you're looking for answers. You're looking for friends who can help you, who can talk to you, who can lead you, but you don't feel comfortable necessarily going to your church. I personally am more than willing to talk to anyone. And I think Justin would be more than willing to talk to anyone too. Yeah, definitely reach out to either of us. And preferably both of us. (laughs) Well, right. (laughs) Because obviously we're going to give you our email address. Justin and I will probably discuss anything that comes to the email, to be honest with you. Yep. We'll discuss it together. To, to, cause you need more than one person to look at things. You know, The Bible says that three strands cannot be broken. It, and that's in reference to two people in God. But what it's telling us is that when more than one believer comes together, they're basically unbreakable. They're unstoppable. God is with them. And so what I'm going to just throw out there 
paratruthradio at gmail.com. Feel free to email us. It's private. No one but me and Justin will ever, ever, ever see it. It'll never see the light of day. It'll only be between, be between me, Justin, and yourself. Uh, if you have any questions, you need help, feel free to email us at paratruthradio at gmail.com. All right, para fans, that's about all we have for this evening. I hope you enjoyed the show. As always, my name is Eric. And I'm Justin. And we will catch you here, same time, same place, only with Paratruth Radio. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode of Paratruth Radio, and you would like to listen to it again, or are interested in listening to any of our past episodes, then you can listen to them on HD at our website, paratruthradio.com. And you can also find us at Stitcher, Blueberry, TuneIn, iTunes, Spreaker, and YouTube. And of course, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for brand new updates of our show every day.